A very handy way to put together everything we've been talking about before is with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or HR for short. So the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram puts together a lot of the different things we've been just seeing. So I'm going to show you a quick, quick diagram of it. So this is how I would sketch it if I did it sort of by hand. Whoops, I'm supposed to do a straight line, and I'm not very good at drawing straight lines today, apparently. It's supposed to be down and across. So first of all, this is a non-linear scale. In other words, the scales here are not linear. They don't just go up and down by the same amounts. In fact, they're logarithmic. But um, if we look at this then, what's represented on this y-axis? That's usually the luminosity. It could also, of course, be the absolute magnitude, because that's a similar thing. Although we use a different scale, but it's the same idea. So we can also say it's the absolute magnitude. That's also the same as luminosity on this axis here. And then on this bottom axis, well, we could have what we call the spectral class. That we could say here. So if we had the spectral class, that would mean it would go O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And then, um, of course, that spectral class also has something to do with the temperature. Remember, that would be the equivalent black body temperature or the surface temperature. That would be in Kelvin. Of course, then things over here would be, I mean, just sort of mentioning random, well, not random numbers, but approximate. So let's say we had 2,600 Kelvin here. Maybe here we had, I don't know, 5,700, let's say, over here. And over here, maybe we have something like 30,000, just to have an idea what these could be. So an O star could be like 30,000, G star might be 5,700 Kelvin, and M star might be something like 2,600. So just, just to have an idea of the temperature. And of course then that could also tell us something about the color of the star. So something over here is probably going to be red, whereas something over here is going to be yellow, which of course is hard to read. And over here, it's probably going to be something that's, you know, blue or whitish. So we have these different things with the color. So this is a very sort of powerful uh, diagram here. What happens is this. Most stars that we see lie along this sort of, this sort of line right here. This line right here, this is called the main sequence. That's what this right here is. Okay, so this, I'm going to label it. This right here is main sequence. And when stars are in the main sequence, that means they are burning, I burned this before, they're burning hydrogen to helium in the core. So stars spend most of their life in the main sequence. Maybe actually we'll write that down. So stars spend most of their life in the, we often just say in the MS, in the main sequence phase. Okay, so most stars, whether they're over here or over here, most stars that we see are found here along this line. So we say that they're main sequence stars. That's because they're busy burning hydrogen to helium. Okay, well that's important. Um, another thing though is this, that the mass of the main sequence stars depends on position. That's another sort of important thing. So over here, let's say, uh, maybe I'll label this different color here. Maybe over here, because here will be high mass. Over here will be, let's say, low mass. So low mass stars are over here, high mass are over here. Okay, so the, the mass of the stars also sort of tells you something about the positions. And also the lifetime of the stars are also going to tell you something like that. So high mass, they also have a short life. So stars that have a very high mass, they actually, and they're very high luminosity here, they actually live a very short life. It can be on the order of, I don't know, like 10 or 20 million years. Whereas the low mass ones, they have a really long life. Okay, so these are here, they have a very long life. So just to sort of give an idea how powerful this is right here. So this right here is called the main sequence. That's what this sort of 
this line right here is called. Now of course we have this region up here. Um, over here these are called red giant. Okay, so we talked about that before. That is where a lot of these main sequence stars, they will end up as red giants eventually. Now we have another region down here called white dwarf. So this is very powerful. I think it, it helps to put everything together in a really nice handy way. So what this tells you then is that, well, most stars spend most of their life along this line. And this line basically tells you that, oh, if you see a red star and it's a main sequence, then it's probably somewhere over here. And then, of course, that can tell you the luminosity of it. Because we've actually got some pretty good um, data for a lot of stars that are found on that main sequence. But what happens is these stars, when they're done with their main sequence, they end up, I mean, over here they go sort of straight over pretty much to the red giant phase, whereas over here they do a few little loops and things, but they basically end up here. And then it depends on the mass of the star then, so what's remaining. So the red giants, they're actually very large right here. These are very, very large stars, and over here they're very small. These white dwarfs are sort of, they're hotter but of course uh, they're dying stars. So what will happen is, let's say our sun, which is a G-type star, which means our sun is probably somewhere like here, according to this graph, or this uh, plot here. Our sun is going to eventually leave the main sequence, which means it's going to stop burning hydrogen to helium in its core, and it's going to start burning other things, so it's going to sort of come up and do some other things. It's going to eventually end up as a red giant and then, because it doesn't have such a big mass, it's eventually going to shed a lot of its um, gases. So it's going to make what we call a planetary nebula. It'll, very, it'll be very nice to look at from far away, I'm sure. And it'll end, eventually end up being a white dwarf. So it'll sort of finish its life here, where it slowly burns out and basically just then stops giving off light. Right? So then we won't, well, no one will be able to see it anymore. It won't give off light, so we can't detect it. But higher mass stars, like these ones, like really, really massive ones, after the red giant phase, they can do more exciting things. Like they might blow up in a supernova, and uh, they might make a neutron star or even a black hole. So I'm going to do some videos later on that talk about those details. But for right now, it suffices to just sort of show you this. Okay, and remember, these don't live very long at all. These live super long. Now, a more detailed version of the HR diagram then is this. So now I think you're sort of ready to take a look at this. So this is the luminosity in solar units. So that basically tells you, oh look, luminosity of one, that should correspond to, yep, that's our sun right there. So there is the sun. That's an important one right there. That's us. All right, so where are we? We are a G star. Of course, it appears yellow, and that tells us also about the luminosity here that roughly is, well, that should be one unit. Now, of course, then our star, what's going to happen is our sun, when it's eventually done that, it's going to go up into the red giant stage, so somewhere up here probably. And we can see that there are some stars that we can see, like Betelgeuse, for example, is really huge. Now, it's a red giant. There's a lot of information, though, found on this uh, graph here, or on this plot. First of all, not only does it tell you luminosity, over here it tells you the type of star. It tells you something about the color of it. See these are blue stars and these are red and these are yellow. And of course it tells you something about the temperature as well. But not only that, um, in little green things it tells you about lifetimes. So remember these are you know 10 to the 7, that's like 10 million years. Whereas down here these are like 10 to the 11 and over here they're kind of infinity. I mean they're very very long-lived stars. We think a lot of those have actually been around since forever and they're never really gonna die. Um, well not on our own time scales at least. So that's this. Also though, you have the mass of the sun in these little purple ones. You can see this has 60 times the mass of the sun. Down here of course it's the mass of the sun and these are 0.1 mass of the sun. So that's why you have a lot of information here. And plus on top of that, see these little lines right here? Those tell you about the solar radius. So in other words, stars along this rough line right here have roughly the same size as our sun. Let's look over here, this is 10 to the 3, which is about a thousand times the sun's radius. And over here, of course, this is one thousandth of the sun's radius. 
keep in mind the scale over here is also not linear. If you look at this, it doesn't go up by the same amounts. So this distance from here to here is supposed to be 3,000 Kelvin, but that same distance from here to here is way more than 3,000 Kelvin. So just keep that in mind that it's a nonlinear scale. Now, not only is this really powerful, you can take a look at some really neat things. So for example, we can see a star that we were looking at before, Sirius. Um, that is a sort of bluish, whitish star here. It's a main sequence one. Whereas uh, things like Polaris, the North Star, uh, that's a big, big one. Betelgeuse is this giant or super giant star. We have Rigel, which is also found in constellation Orion, where uh, Betelgeuse is also found. We have Arcturus, which is a very bright one. And what's kind of neat is that Sirius over here, there's also, um, I mean, there's another one called Sirius B. And for example, this here is a white dwarf here. So there's some really neat things here that, you know, Sirius, for example, is a uh, binary star system. So Sirius B is a little white dwarf, whereas the regular Sirius one, that one is a huge one. Uh, and it's a main sequence one. Now over here, for example, you can see there's lots of binary stars like Alpha Centauri B, and there's uh, you know Alpha Centauri A, and there's you know 61 Cygni A and 61 Cygni B. We have Gliese or Gliese. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce that one. But, you know 725 A and B. So these are here are binary stars. So there's lots and lots of binary stars around. Proxima Centauri, by the way, that's the closest star that we know of. It's just over four light years away. Uh, so this just sort of gives an idea of some of this really neat stuff that you can see all from this one diagram. So this HR diagram, super useful. So what does it do for us? So what do these diagrams help us with? Well, first of all, we take the spectrum of a star. That's the first sort of goal. Remember, it's not just pretty astronomy here. We're actually doing lots of things with it. You can do much more than just pretty pictures, right? Take the spectrum of the star. That allows us to do lots of physics with it. So first of all, that tells us the, um, well, it'll tell us the class or, you know, the temperature of the star. So if we know the class or the temperature of the star, well, what does that tell us? That tells us what it is made of. Well, not only that, it tells us a lot of other things. It's class and temperature. Um, the other thing that the spectrum gives us, I mean, they can tell us, um, let's see here, well, the HR plot, actually, I guess I should say this, not really the spectrum, sorry, uh, the spectrum tells us this, yes. We also have the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, that tells us um, something really important, which is the luminosity. So when I say that, what I mean is, um, well, this can tell us really sort of how bright it really is. Because something may appear bright, but that's only because it's close to us. So for example, let's just say we take a spectrum of a star. Let's say we look at some random star like Sirius. What we would do is we would take its spectrum and that would tell us over here, that would tell us where it sits on the x-axis. So its spectral class will tell us something about this, and it'll also tell us its temperature and its color. Um, and once we know that, if we know it's a main sequence star, and we can tell that from some things from its spectrum, so if we know that it's a main sequence star, that means from this diagram, you notice that we can sort of go up here and then look at where that sits along over here. So do you see that just from its spectral class, if we know it's a main sequence star, that means that we can go up on this diagram, go left, and that means we know its luminosity. Okay, so the HR diagram tells us its luminosity. And this is sort of the steps that one does. So you first take the spectrum, tells you the class and temperature. That sort of also tells you what it's made of, which is kind of cool. And from that, you can use the HR diagram to guess or to tell you the luminosity. And that tells you how bright it really is. Now, of course, from that then, its apparent brightness and luminosity, those can tell you the distance. Uh, which is really cool. So that's, of course, how far away it is. Um, and the way we can do that is because once we know luminosity, we can easily measure the apparent brightness. And remember, apparent brightness is related to luminosity by this equation. Right, so we have this one here. So that's how we can sort of get that. 
So once we know the luminosity, which is difficult to know, but see this diagram can help us to know this. Keep in mind that helps if we know it's a main sequence star. If we know it's a red giant, then of course we can tell the same sort of thing Go over here, tell its luminosity, and from there we can tell then how far away it is. So that's kind of a cool thing. So this HR diagram tells us tons of stuff. It's really, really important, and that's why I thought it was important to spend a whole set of videos just talking about this. Okay, so we've done a lot of videos so far looking at all these uh, features that we would need in order to put it all together in a very elegant way which Hertzsprung and Russell figured out and that's why uh, most astronomers they definitely know and love this diagram here because it tells you a lot of things about stars.